to another episode of Boring History. My name is Angela and in today's episode we're going to be having a look at werewolves in German folklore. And this video is the result of another excellent request so thank you so much for your suggestion because we have an exciting collection of stories to get through. We've got a farmer who gets tried as a werewolf and then loses his head, a widow who makes a deal with the devil so she can support herself and always have meat on the table. And we're going to be finishing off with a story that sounds a lot like the werewolf version of the Pied Piper. However, to begin with, let's just quickly have a look at werewolves in general because they by no means originate in German folklore. The earliest record that we have of a man to wolf transformation is actually found in the Epic of Gilgamesh which dates to around 2100 BC. And some of the first mentions of werewolves, which are kind of more aligned with what we would think of today when we think of werewolves, actually dates all the way back to ancient Greece. There's a Greek myth where Zeus gets annoyed at someone and then turns him and his sons into wolves. And then in book four of Herodotus, we get the following snippet. The Greeks who live in Scythia say that once a year, every Nurian becomes a wolf for a few days and then reverts to his original state. Now, just in case you think that means there was a tribe of werewolves running around ancient Greece, Herodotus assures us by going on to say, Personally, I do not believe this, but they make the claim despite its implausibility. Do you know what? If you're looking for something interesting, just go to book four of Herodotus because it's full of these types of gems. And for context, the land that the Nuri or the area that the Nuri lived on now makes up part of Russia. But never mind all that because we're some supposed to be looking at werewolves in Germany. Now I'll admit it's a little bit hard to find anything which definitively says this was the first recorded instance of a werewolf in Germany. Because I guess none of the early werewolf victims survived to tell the tale. But one of the earliest, most well documented cases of a werewolf was actually the trial of a man called Peter Stulben. <laughs> Also, just as an FYI, there are many variations to the spelling of Peter's last name, so we're just going to call him Peter. Our story begins in the late 1580s when the gentle town folk of three German villages had been terrorised by an evil wolf gallivanting around the countryside. But this was no ordinary wolf because this particular wolf seemed extra cruel and greedy not normal wolf traits. I mean, sure, it killed sheep and cattle just as one would expect from an ordinary wolf, but this particular wolf really seemed to have it in for the townspeople. And it was not uncommon for the villagers to find the arms and legs of missing men and women scattered around their field. And the general consensus was, if you were missing a child, you may as well go ahead and make another one because there was no way you were ever going to see that child again. Now for years, hunters tried to kill this monstrous wolf, but it kept eluding them. Until one day, the hunters were finally able to catch the wolf unaware and set their dogs on it. The dogs surrounded the wolf and the wolf was trapped and the hunters were excited that they had finally managed to capture the wolf. But just as they were about to go in for the kill shot, the wolf transformed and suddenly in its place stood a man with a walking stick. Now at first the hunters were like, oh my god, that is the devil. But then one of them was like, nah, that looks like Peter from down the road. Now the hunters were not unreasonable men and they didn't want to jump to any conclusions. Because after all, it was possible that this man really wasn't Peter and instead was a demon who had decided to look like Peter or possibly even the devil himself in disguise. So they took the maybe Peter lookalike and went to the actual Peter's house. I mean, it was the middle of the night, so if this wasn't the real Peter, the real Peter should definitely be in his bed asleep. But when they got to Peter's house, it was empty. So the hunters dragged their captive before the local judge and informed him that this man was in fact the wolf that had been terrorizing all the villagers over all these years. Now, even though this was the 16th century, these people weren't barbarians and they weren't about to convict someone without a confession. So the judge kindly informed Peter that if he did not confess, he would be tortured. Peter sighed and was like, look, I'm not a werewolf per se. However, for the last 25 years or so, I've been practicing black magic, cannibalism, the dark arts, and other naughty things. And the way that I'm able to change into a wolf is via this girdle that was a present given to me by the devil. So if I put on the girdle, I'm a wolf. If I take it off again, I'm a human. 
Make sense? Now, as you can imagine, this caused the judge and the local townspeople to be like, well, if that's the truth, why don't you hand over the belt? To which Peter replied, no. The hunters went back to the field where they captured Peter and they ransacked his house, but they couldn't find the magical belt anywhere. And poor Peter, because even though he'd confessed to all of the murders and all of the evil happenings, they still decided to torture him. Until finally on October 31st, 1589, he was beheaded. His head was placed on a stake outside of the village, just as a warning to other werewolves or sorcerers who were thinking of stopping by. And his unfortunate wife and mistress were burned at the stake because everyone was like, well, obviously they had to have helped him. Now the whole trial and execution of this werewolf sorcerer called Peter was such a big deal that they actually put together a pamphlet which outlined the whole Peter story. This pamphlet was then translated to English and it made it all the way to London and all across Europe. Now it should also be noted that this pamphlet didn't actually use the word werewolf. But you know, if it quacks like a wolf. So what should we make of this little story? I mean, a trial was held in the court of law. An official pamphlet was made that was distributed around the world. So obviously our friend Peter had to be super evil and guilty, right? Well, for a bit of context, Peter was a very wealthy farmer and he owned a fair bit of land. So it has been suggested that the conviction and accusations of Peter were all fabricated and were politically motivated. Now also I just quickly want to jump back to that magical girdle that turns you into a wolf. Because that in itself is quite interesting and the girdle also pops up in other legends and I think some of the stories that come from Russia also feature it. So as I mentioned the girdle or the belt was a gift from the devil and you pretty much had to sell your soul to get it. Now the annoying thing about the girdle was once you had received it you were stuck with it forever and you couldn't get rid of it no matter how badly you wanted to. So so essentially you were indentured to the devil forever. Which of course then begs the question, why would anybody even want this girdle? Now for one, if your cupboards were bare, it was a lot easier to go and secure yourself a nice and tasty sheep as a wolf. Because nobody would be like, oh my god, Bob stole one of my sheep. No, they would be like, a wolf killed one of my sheep. How annoying. Now the only way that you could defend yourself against one of these werewolves was by knowing the name of the person who had put on the girdle and transformed into a wolf. Because if you called out their name, they would instantly transform back into a human. Now a story that demonstrates both of these points goes as follows. In the days before supermarkets, there was a woman whose husband had died and so she'd lived alone for many years. And yet somehow she was always able to put fresh meat on the table when somebody popped around for dinner. One day her, let's say nephew, popped around for dinner and he was like, Auntie, how did you manage to get this piece of mutton? I mean, you're so little physically, how would you even manage to lift and butcher a sheep on your own? And the woman was like, well, nephew, I'll show you exactly how I do it. All you have to do is climb on the roof and keep an eye on the paddock at the back of the house. The nephew did as he was asked and before long he saw a wolf running towards the sheep that were grazing in that paddock. The shepherd and the dog who were protecting the sheep tried their best to defend the flock against the wolf and they almost managed to succeed in killing it. Except the nephew had worked out what was going on and he'd shouted out his aunt's name in warning. Now of course, because he had shouted out his aunt's name, she transformed back into a human mid-struggle with the shepherd and she just barely managed to escape with her life. Now the story doesn't say whether or not the shepherd ended up dobbing on her, but considering there's no mention of a trial made, I think she was pretty okay. So let's move on to the second reason that this werewolf girdle was useful. Apparently, if you wore it and transformed into a wolf, you would have the uncanny ability to know if a villager or a traveller was walking through the forest carrying a lot of money. Which means that you would always know who was worth to ambush, eat and rob. And finally, we can't be talking about German werewolf legends without hearing at least one story that was collected by the Grimm brothers. It was said that in Livland, which is actually part of modern day Estonia I think, or Latvia, not Germany, although Somehow back in the day it was part of Germany or they spoke German. Something like that. Do you know what? Doesn't matter. It's a good story. We're going to move on. It's said that once Christmas Day is over in Livland, there's a boy with a terrible limp who wanders the streets calling out for all those who have submitted to the evil one 
and commands that they follow him. This boy is accompanied by a large tall man who carries a whip that's made of braided iron. And if anyone who has been tainted by evil refuses to follow the boy, this man whips them into submission. As the tainted people slowly fall into line and follow the men, it's said that they begin to lose their human form and gradually transform into wolves. The wolves are led to a field that is filled with cattle and they're let loose to devour and attack as many of them as they can. <laughs> Baby, the cows are alright. It's okay. Now these wolves pose no risk to any of the other villagers because magic prevents them from attacking humans. So for 12 days, the wolves and the boy with the limp and the man with the whip wander around the countryside. And at the end of the 12 days, the tainted people lose their wolf form and once again become human. And it's said that those who were whipped were whipped so cruelly that the scars that were made will stay with them forever. The end. So, what do we think of this story? Is it a moral lesson? Are these evil people made to repent for their sins? Are they then absolved for all their crimes at the end of 12 days? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And with that, we've reached the end of today's video. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you'll subscribe because I look forward to sharing even more boring history with you in the future.